Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining the Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live, blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free KMET live streaming app on Google Play or the Apple App Store. A huge shout out to the team at the station, Mitch, Bill and Sean, and to our special advisory committee, Bill Morris of UCI School of Business, Diane Cavallo, and Camila Rubio. Don't forget to check out the Jay Kaplan Show, also on KMET, on Fridays at 3. But today, I am extremely thrilled and honored to be introducing today's guest. And just a little hint, um, you know, nothing big. She just happens to manage the fifth largest economy in the world. And with that said, I am absolutely honored and thrilled to introduce today, California State Treasurer, Fiona Ma. Fiona Ma is California's 34th state treasurer. She was elected on November 6, 2018, with more votes than any other candidate for treasurer in the state's history. She is the first woman of color and the first woman certified public accountant elected to the position. The state treasurer's office was created in the California Constitution in 1849. It provides financing for schools, roads, housing, recycling, and waste management, hospitals, public facilities, and other crucial infrastructure projects that better the lives of residents. California is the world's fifth largest economy, and Treasurer Ma is the state's primary banker. Her office processes more than $2 trillion in transactions within a typical year. She provides transparency and oversight for the government's investment portfolio accounts, as well as for the state's surplus funds. Treasurer Ma oversees an estimate portfolio that has an average over 100 billion, that is an investment portfolio that averaged well over during administration, a significant portion of which are beneficially owned by more than 2,200 local governments in California. She serves as agent of sale for all state bonds and is trustee of billions of dollars of state indebtedness. Thank you so much for joining me today, Fiona. Thank you, Yvette. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Well, thank you for joining us, Treasurer Ma. Um, I love learning about our guest backgrounds and oftentimes to make assumptions of how someone got to where they are, right? So oftentimes the journey is not linear. Uh, instead, it's very spontaneous, unplanned, and serendipitous. So please talk to us to serve such a tremendous platform to serve and the, mat- the motivation behind those efforts. Yeah, so thank you, Yvette. Yes, um, I never thought I would be in elected office. Uh, I am the oldest daughter of immigrant. My parents wanted us to be one of the lead professions, lawyer, engineer, accountant, or a doctor. Since I was good at math, they decided I should be an accountant early on and trained me actually uh, to be good in our checkbook and preparing our taxes. Uh, And so that's what I did. Um, when I first graduated from the Rochester Institute of Technology is I started with one of the big eight accounting firms in the real estate tax department. After five years, uh, I quit and started my own practice and became president of a small business association. And it was the first time at the age of 28 years old that I actually got involved in politics. I had to go down to see be the mayor and the board of supervisors, went to Sacramento to testify got involved in the 1995 White House Conference on Small Business and started to understand that we need to be at the table. Um, So much happens uh, at the elected level, whether it's allocating money or sponsoring bills and policy. And I wanted to uh, get more involved. And I kind of asked my parents to bless me 
It took them eight years before they would actually throw up their hands and say, okay, that's what you want to do. But four elected positions later, I have never lost once, knock on wood. And that's because I don't want my parents to say, (laughs) I told you so. Number two, I hope I never have to go back and do people's taxes again. So this is the calling. I'm very happy every day. I wake up doing something that I love for the state of California. And I'm just glad that now as a state treasurer, I'm actually utilizing all of my educational, my professional, private sector, and my public sector experience in this job. Oh, that is awesome. Um, I I love that you are so inspired and that your parents, you know, kind of guided you early on with your very special skill set in math and numbers, because those are skill sets that not everybody's born with. So when those identified and you have parents like yours that recognized it and valued it and steered it in the right direction, then we have someone like you that can help us manage our finances and do something like um, earn the state of California $100 billion through the investment portfolio. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to make that happen for the state of California? Uh, Well, um, I am the state's banker, so every tax fine, the interest penalty comes into my office it's about $2.5 trillion every year. And whatever the state is not using, I invest the state's idle funds as well as the funds for 22 local government units. I think today was about $180 billion. And that's really in liquid uh, short term investments in case the state or our local government partners need the money. Um, it has to be readily available. And I also issue all the bonds. For the state of California, general obligation revenue bonds, as well as for the UC and CSU systems. And during the whole pandemic, the last two years, our bonds have been oversubscribed in the state of California. That means that investors have a lot of confidence in the people, the ingenuity, all the you know initiatives and the mandates that we uh, are working toward. Um, and so that is really, really good news for the people of California and our state. Let's talk about a past project that you helped support and, you know, have materialized and really serve, uh, you know, the critical needs of of our state. And that is through a project that you supported at Loma Linda University Medical Center. Can you please paint the picture and walk us through what occurred and how you were able to come in and make sure that they were able to have the funding necessary to complete construction? Yeah, so since uh, 2015, the state of California, thanks to our uh, our voters, have passed three sets of hospital or children's hospital bonds. And so when I started here three years ago, uh, there's a little glitch, uh, maybe a little miscommunication between uh, the hospital system as well as my office, and I was able to Uh, reach out to members of the Inland Empire community that supported uh, this hospital as the only regional um, high quality institution and that they needed the money and somehow the bond money was stuck. So we were able to uh, $3 million in July of 2019. uh, And now we attended the groundbreaking and the ribbon cutting. But Loma Linda can also apply for another $135 million in dedicated children's bonds. They haven't done it yet, so you can let the audience know. Oh, there you go. Eligible for another $135 million. They just have to apply for it. I hope Loma Linda University, you have uh, the ability to apply for another $100 million. Don't miss out. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. And so um, I know that you are looking very much towards um, infrastructure, uh, development, and programs that serve our state. Can you please uh, talk about the ones that to you today? Yes. So I formed an ad hoc committee. It's called the Housing, Economic Development, and Opportunity Zone Ad Hoc Committee when I first started. It it is comprised of 14 individuals around the state that are me, my ears and eyes toward different projects, um, municipalities that need financing or 
funding to uh, reach out, right? And let everybody know all the resources we have here in my office. So one of our big projects is the Brightline train project from Apple Valley, Victorville, direct to Las Vegas. It would be a 90 minute um, without nonstop, 90 minute nonstop uh, train ride, but now they want to expand. They want to expand down to Rancho Cucamonga. So they bought uh, some property down there and been even closer to Al Monte so that you can get on a train at Union Station, check your luggage in, and your luggage will show up at your hotel room in Las Vegas, and you will be able to ride an all-electric, clean train, fast train through the desert uh, to Las Vegas and back. Um, so that has been a three-year project. Uh, they are still working and moving toward that. But in the meantime, I've been helping Banning with some film studios, Upland with a parking lot, Fontana uh, with their women's club, uh, Adelanto upgrading their grid, the Coachella Valley with their housing catalyst fund. So as people reach out to me and I go out and, and see and, and listen, then we start forming these projects, um, goals that we want to do for that city, that region. Uh, and it's been very, very exciting. Oh, that sounds just phenomenal. So can you please share, you know, just a broad overall view of the, you know, financial position for the state of California so that we can get an understanding of um, the office's appetite for investing in these projects as they become uh, presented to you? Yeah, so the Legislative Analyst Office recently issued a report uh, letting us know that they estimate that we will again have a surplus anywhere from $7 billion to $35 billion. And in last year's budget, if you had followed, uh, the governor worked closely with the legislature to basically grant uh, their wish list, their top priority, hard to fund one-time shovel-ready infrastructure projects. So knowing that we're going to have a surplus again this year, I am also going out again, letting folks know, reach out to your assembly member, your senator. If you have those projects that you never thought were going to be funded, really, really difficult, complicated, uh, that now is the time to contact them and put in your wish list because I think there's going to be uh, money again for these type of infrastructure projects around And is the there a centralized location? location where people can go and gather the information that they need to find out who they need to contact for, you know, uh, finding out what opportunities exist with these funds that are available? Well, first, you start off with your assembly member in your Senate, um, and then you can put in your address, and they will, um, the website will let you know who your member of the legislature uh, is. So that's a starting point. Um, obviously, you know, all of us are on social media, on Twitter, I'm, I'm at Fiona Ma on Twitter is where I post most of the grant opportunities, loans, um, other type of, you know, budget items on there. And so I would encourage folks to you know, sign up with me, with others. I have a monthly newsletter that goes out as well. Uh, so lots of opportunities to engage with your elected officials. Oh, that's amazing. So can you, you know, I guess we could all call ourselves treasurers in our own home, in our own microeconomical world, right? And we all have philosophies on how we distribute those funds. Um, can you please share with us uh, your philosophy um, as you move forward um, as uh, the state treasurer, as well as the office's philosophy as you serve uh, California residents for the distribution of those funds. What are the things that you take into account? How do you top rate projects? You know, what is it that you're looking for? Um, do you have a wish list of initiatives you are eager to see but have not seen? Um, just share with us um, some broad thoughts and ideas of the office and your philosophy moving forward. Sure. Uh, so besides being the banker, I also chair uh, TCAC and SIDLAC, for example, the Tax Credit Allocation Committee and the Tax uh, California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. And we allocate the bonds and the tax credits out to affordable housing developers around the state. And this is a competitive process right now. So at our office with my board members, 
we set up different criteria to uh, enable you know, these folks to compete. And they basically have to be shovel ready. They have to be, you know, all the financing has to be in place. Um, and so it, it is um, not easy, but we are there are working with our staff. When they apply, they're ready because you don't wanna forfeit your tax credits or your bonds because that could create penalties. Uh, point penalties, as well as uh, withhold the, the performance deposit. So they have to be ready. Other programs like our sales tax exempt program for those expensive uh, equipment that is going to clean and green our environment, they can apply to waive their sales taxes. And that could be up to 10%. But again, that program is very competitive. So we are always doing outreach. We have webinars. We have consultants that will help um, companies uh, fill out the application and better compete. So it's all about outreach, outreach, outreach. But again, if you have projects that you need assistance with, companies that want to locate or expand here, <coughs> um, affordable housing projects, we're now also working on student housing on community college sites. So that's a new initiative uh, to us. And if you are a community college with land, that want to build student housing, again, please reach out to us. And, and it's all about, right, knowledge is power. If you don't know, exactly, you don't know how to apply. Uh, we've also done about 300 Zoom webinars uh, these past two years, helping small businesses, seniors, nonprofits, and others uh, with these loan grants and um, uh, financing programs. So again, follow us, call us. Let us know what some of your wish list items are, and maybe we can make them come true. <laughs> and so of the 17 programs that you have, because there are a significant number of programs and very broad, wide reaching programs, um, which would you say is going to be most useful, you know, to the everyday Californian that is, you know, the family going to work every day, coming home and providing for their children? Are there programs that, you know, can benefit everyday families, working class families, um, you know, and assist their bottom lines as well? Yeah, so we have a lot, and I know we don't have all day to talk about all the programs, but I also oversee three savings programs. Scholarship 529 is one of the longest running here at the office, and that is um, a program to encourage parents, grandparents, godparents to save for their child's higher education. Uh, we just passed a law. Uh, this past uh, year signed by the governor that would now allow this money to go to apprenticeship programs because we know not everybody wants to go to a, you know, accredited um, two or four year university, but they do have other skills and some of it can go to pay down student loan debt. So we're trying to make it uh, broader, allow more people to use it and encourage people. Cal Savers is another program that started a couple years ago. If you work for an employer and they don't offer a retirement savings account and they employ more than four, five people or more, they will eventually have to sign up their roster with our Cal Savers program. And it's about signing up, you know, forget it and let it um, build uh, for your retirement savings or um, some rainy day event that you may not have predicted. Similarly, I also oversee Cal Able. That's a program if you are disabled, diagnosed before the age of 26 years old, you can now save up to $15,000 in that person's name. In the past, it was only $2,000. You probably heard when parents want to leave their house to their child who has a disability, parents say, no, 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 my child can't have any assets, they can't have a bank account, they can't have a house. Well, we are trying to save uh, to change that around, to give independence and dignity for those people who have a disability. And we're hoping that the federal government will change the onset of disability to 46 years old, because we know veterans come back after service, people get into um, disability later on in life, but everybody should have the ability to save money in their own name. Absolutely. I completely agree. And that's, that is a tremendous program. That is amazing. 
interesting. And you're right, uh, Treasure Ma, when you talk about, you know, uh, not knowing what you don't know and education being the foundation of that, right? Whether it's an education on the street treasurer's office and what it it was in your background that motivated you to pursue, you know, becoming the California street treasurer, which is amazing because it's the fifth largest economy in the world. And the fact that you're managing more more than $3.2 trillion in banking transactions. I mean, that is quite um, a cry from, uh, I'm guessing, the kitchen table, uh, balancing the, you know, the the house finances and your balance checks and everything else, right? Or even preparing your taxes. How old were you the first time you prepared taxes? Well, I've been with my dad since I was five years old. Wow. Uh, doing whatever he needed. He's been training me, um, you know, in the world of finances. I mean, I've been doing our taxes. Well, I'm a CPA, obviously. Right. So I've been doing taxes all my life, pretty much. But helping my family members and doing a lot of pro bono work for nonprofits uh, because, you know, it's expensive to have your taxes prepared and it's important. I've got a couple other programs you may be excited about. Yes, let's hear them. Pro- Programs. Okay, so we, uh, governor and the legislature, uh, put uh, are creating a new program called Cal Kids. Three point seven million accounts are going to be open up for every baby that is born, and the state is going to fund their accounts with five hundred dollars when they're born, and they will add an additional five hundred dollars if the child is a foster youth or a homeless student um, going uh, forward. And this is really exciting because we are really trying to establish that uh, savings mentality, you know, for our newborns, for our uh, students and the parents, and to incentivize them to continue to deposit money, let it grow after we open these accounts. I love that. And Um, so you're creating a a financial uh, responsibility pipeline, it sounds like. It's it's, it's like a child's uh, savings account because some people don't have access to banking, um, either the high fees or they're just nervous about opening up a bank account. And so having the state administer these programs for the life of their sometimes um, where it's open and transparent, um, they can access through internet, um, don't ask for documentation or credit history. This is really an account to help their kids uh, save for college education and for life. Right. And those are all critical elements to have as a foundation in life, right, is financial literacy and understanding and hopefully even beyond understanding, but thriving in the financial world, such as yourself and being able to, uh, you know, use that talent to benefit yourself and others as well, of course. And, you know, so one of the great things that I really enjoy about this program is the fact that we're able to capture, you know, this information and use it as a resource. Um, just the other day, I was invited to my hometown, which is La Mirada, uh, to their local Rotary meeting. I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Raymond Fernandez, the president over there. And I, I joined the meeting. It was great. And I ran into an old friend who actually, she and I were on the track in the cross country team together. And I come to find out she is now um, a teacher and instructor at our local uh, Norwalk La Mirada Unified School, School District, where I grew up in. And she is teaches history. And she was expressing to me the fact that she was working towards creating a pipeline to making her high school students go into their local college, which in this case was Cerritos College. And I said, Adrienne, I am so glad we had this conversation because there is a program that exists already. There's 10 years worth of data that says that it works and it has proven to show that there, the number of students that go to college or to a trade school or to secondary education from high school is four times the national average. And the name of that program is 
promise scholars. And in fact, you know, I was honored enough to interview uh, Dr. James Hammond, the developer of Promise Scholars, as well as Ms. Monica Ayala, who happens to be the executive director for Promise Scholars. Again, an amazing educational program that starts in kindergarten. As you mentioned, when you talk about the birth of a child and opening an account and spearheading and making that um, element of their life pronounced and important and of significance to the child and to the parents as a, you know, journey through life, right? But just bringing it up and just providing that framework is a tremendous value. And so I'm really hoping that uh, we can get Adrian and Dr. Hammond and, and Miss Ayala together so that Rather than reinventing the wheel, as we all know, is not fun and not necessary. We can apply and implement a framework of things that actually work and have shown success. And I'm so excited that you are here sharing your success and the framework that you have implemented in order to create, um, you know, a sustainable uh, banking system for our state, especially as we navigate these times. Thank you. Yes. And, and community college now is free for first time uh, um, college students. And many of the community colleges actually have a feeder program into a UC or a CSU. So I highly recommend if your child doesn't know what they want to do in life, uh, go to a community college first. Perfect. Perfect. And with that said, we're going to go on break and come back and talk about a lot of great things, including um, earthquake mitigation. And strategies. Um, we're going to talk about your work with the Redlands uh, University president and so much more. So everybody stay tuned. Every two seconds, someone needs a blood transfusion. Be on the giving side. Livestream Blood Bank supports patients in 80 Southern California hospitals. Call 1-800-TRY-GIVING for more information and to set an appointment. City of Hope is driven to making a difference in the lives of people with cancer and diabetes. We accomplish this by conducting innovative research and providing outstanding care. If you or a loved one has received a cancer diagnosis, go to cityofhope.org to learn more about how our innovative approach could change your outcome. Being sued and don't know who to turn to? The insurance company won't defend you and your family in a lawsuit? Stress no more. Call the Walker Law Group. We are the law on your side. Just call 909-989-3200. 909-989-3200. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. go.laverne.edu. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. I am here today with California State Treasurer Fiona Ma and she is sharing with us all of her amazing secrets, especially the most interesting one that I've heard today, where she was able to earn State of California $100 billion through the investment portfolio that she manages through the State of California's Treasurer's Office. So before we went to break, we were talking about the importance of education and sharing and creating a catalyst for uh, sharing frameworks that actually work versus uh, basically uh, reforming wheel, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel if something already exists and is working. So I'm very excited to be capturing this information with Treasurer Ma and uh, for her to be sharing it with us. Thank you so much for being with us today, Treasurer Ma. Um, so as we move into the next question, uh, one of the items that we discussed that was extremely fascinating to me, again, another entity here local to the region of what we call 
called the Inland M. The fact that you recently met with Esri. Um, and Esri, for those that don't know, are basically a global imaging uh, systems uh, developer here in Redlands, and um, they just do amazing work around the world. Um, Treasurer Ma, can you please share with us what it is that you're working with Esri uh, with today? Sure. Yeah, so um, many of my friends out in the region uh, have said, have you met with Esri? You need to come see Esri. Their campus is amazing. Their technology is, is like out of this world. And when I went to meet with them, um, my mind was blown. I was like, wow, this little gem, you know, when you drive in and, you know, the beautiful trees and the glass and um, it's just like an oasis out there, but their technology, the way they're able to use their mapping system uh, to show visually whether it's climate change or fires or water level. Uh, and they, um, you know, basically challenged me and said, hey, we would love to do a project with you. Um, you know, if you can let us know. Uh, we would be very interested in collaborating with the treasurer's office. So I thought about it. And a couple of days later, I talked to my good friend, Ali Sahabi of Optimum Seismic. And we've been working on seismic safety mitigation. We always say the big one is going to come. We just don't know when. Uh, this is something that I've been working on since I was on our supervisors almost 20 years ago when representing San Francisco, the Sunset District, we have a lot of soft story buildings built on sand. And so if there's another major earthquake that hits the San Francisco Bay Area, I district uh, was and is probably the most vulnerable. So taking it one step up, many multifamily affordable housing units that were built back in the 70s are built on soft story. They are not seismic, seismically safe or upgraded. And I asked Ali and Evan Reese of the um, um, Resiliency Council to work with Esri to see if they could help us map out where these buildings are around the state so that we can figure out um, where the hotspots are. And then I can work with the legislators or the members of Congress to try to get more funding because money follows data. If you don't have data, then they're going to say, well, it sounds good, but come back to us when you know the exact need or the exact number. Uh, and so that's what we're working on with Esri. And we're very, very excited to release uh, our, our project uh, soon. We will let you know, um, but feel like this is like a game changer for the state of California and for many families who are living in these vulnerable soft story apartments. Oh, I love the program is going to be focused on uh, soft uh, development project. Now, will it also be used as a more general resource for the population as perhaps uh, increased uh, geologic activities continue, you know, happens, or if for some reason the readings are maybe indicating that there is a propensity for a larger earthquake to occur, what are the dynamics that you're looking to um, develop from this program? Uh, first off is, is um, getting the inventory of these soft story uh, multifamily apartment units. That's number one. Then creating a program and funding that could go help retrofit uh, these buildings to make it more stable and secure in case of a minor earthquake. Thirdly, obviously, is preparing an early warning system for these communities, uh, making sure that um, they understand, you know, where they live, um, what the you know, escape route is, what they should prepare for in case of an earthquake. Because once a year, we do this drill called the uh, big uh, shakeout. You're, you're supposed to get a text message and then you're supposed to practice, right? How do you, you know, hide or run or, you know, what are you supposed to do in an earthquake? And we only do that once a year. We should be really aware of an emergency situation, similar to what's happening with our fires, right? When we 
um, get that evacuation order. We want people to take it seriously. We want people to evacuate, not like wait around, pack your bags, you know, for, you know, all of your mementos. I mean, we always say when you get that call, you need to evacuate. Similarly, if we get that early warning system for earthquakes, we need to also evacuate as quickly as possible. Right. So it's just a matter of education and programming and bringing to the top of mind what these initiatives are developed for. That is phenomenal. I love that. That is a dream come true, I'm sure, for a lot of Californians. Um, you know, I was born and I've grown up in California, but I will never get used to the earthquakes. I don't care how small it is. I always get that very nervous pit in my stomach anytime the ground starts shaking. Yeah, so I'm sure myself and many, many millions of Californians will be very, very thankful to see that uh, technology come online. And when are you projected to see that start, um, you know, uh, picking up the information, start uh, presenting some of that data? Yeah, we were supposed to launch it uh, at the Great Shakeout about a week ago, but we just couldn't get it, um, you know, get everything um prepared in time, roll it out correctly. And so we are taking our time to make sure that when we do roll it out, um, that we raise as much awareness, um, educate the public, and really think about the applications. Like you said, this is the first stage, right? Understanding, having it shown, um, you know, being able to click in, but then what is the next step, right? So we want to have a series of you know, uh, timelines and uh, to do's. And that's what we're working on right now. Wonderful, wonderful. Is there a projected date for that rollout to start activating maybe the first of the year or are you guys just kind of playing it by ear? Well, obviously we'd like to do it as soon as possible. Uh, but when we do roll it out, obviously there's going to be, you know, phone calls, there's going to be questions. And so we're trying to think about, you know, all the different possibilities for this technology and this application once pull it out to be able to answer those questions, have those 800 numbers, have those people who can, you know, help and answer questions in different languages even, right? And then what are the mitigation efforts? Who should we be targeting, lobbying to get more money for soft story retrofits, renovations, um, mitigation uh, efforts? So that is all also part of the federal infrastructure program. Um, we are lobbying the federal government to put more money into these type of infrastructure uh, retrofits. Um, it's in there, but it's kind of a, a ancillary component would be more of a priority where they allocate a certain amount for this type of mitigation. Right. Efforts. And as we know, mitigation efforts are so critical when you're looking to preserve, you know, a specific asset, whatever that may be. And obviously, uh, um, a Seacoff story. A story. Soft story uh, asset, right? And if we can find ways to hear them and mitigate the impacts of an earthquake, that is going to uh, be a benefit to all Californians in the long run, right? Because uh, rather than having to worry about a completely crumbled building, uh, we can worry about maybe a building that needs a few repairs uh, after it's been retrofitted, right? So um, that end is asset. And what what brought you to this um, idea and to, you know, something like this could be done through uh, Esri? Well, first off, when I first moved to California in 1989 from the East Coast, we didn't have earthquakes. And so my first introduction was the Loma Prieta earthquake that happened during the Giants game. And I was working in the tallest building back then, San Francisco, the Bank of America building, and the whole building started rocking. Uh, and everybody started screaming, and I really had no clue uh, what this was. And like you said, like when I think about it, it gives me yeah. goosebumps. It makes me, um, you know, kind of sick um, when I think about uh, earthquakes. And then as we're moving forward, understanding that these buildings are out there, they've been built, but there is not one set database. And that's where Esri came in, is being able to compile and um, transform what is out there to what is something that's digital, that you can go on a website, you can click on an icon, 
actually see the address, how many units are in there, how many people are living in there. You can see a picture of the building, right? That's what people want. They don't just want data, but they want to be able to see uh, and understand, you know, how big or small a problem is. And that's where Esri comes in. Beautiful. And the technology and every single detail. And I hope to one day, Esri, if you're listening, come be a guest on the Southern California Business Report. We want to hear all about you and the this technology you are imparting all over the world, not just locally, regionally, or in the country, but literally all over the world and for various, various applications. It just blows my mind when I look at all the amazing things that they're doing. So with that said, I, I know that your heart is in working with projects and infrastructure. And one of the projects you're going to be working on are film studios. Can you talk about that and where they're going to be? Yeah, so I am a SAG-AFTRA uh, member um, for a long time. And I was also on the California Film Commission. And knowing that filming is leaving our state to Georgia, for example, to New Mexico, uh, to Canada and Mexico, um, how do we attract filming back to the state of California? And film studios is one of uh, the issues. Um, there is no available film studios for these smaller productions, these minority Latinx, African-American, LGBT, Asian uh, films. And that's the genesis of this project is really to create those smaller, uh, more customized studios so that we can bring back filming, but also not have them compete directly with all of the big guys who have cornered the market for many years. They have all the big film studios, they have the film tax credits, uh, but how do we grow these smaller productions that um, are going to be are, are in vogue right now. If you look at who is being nominated for Academy Awards in different categories, the Squid Games, I don't know if you've saw, seen the Squid I've Games heard, yes. right now, and that is Korean uh, films in Korea. Um, obviously, uh, Shang-Chi, which is the Marvel uh, comic uh, movie that is a blockbuster. That is mostly an Asian cast by Asian uh, you know, producers and directors. So there is a movement now for more diversity in films. Um, and how do we bring it back? That's kind of where we have to start is we need more studio space. I, I completely agree. And it sounds like a filmmaker's dream come true and a, a wonderful space for a variety of ideas and stories to come through um, with more freedom and less, uh, you know, bureaucracy and red tape. Uh, so can you share with us what these film studios are going to look like or what they're going to be like in relation to, you know, uh, the everyday Hollywood studios that we see at Univios and those backlog students, there's something different or, or greater about them. Can you please describe what these film studios are going to be looking like or um, be prepared to do? Well, uh, um, the rendering should be gonna smaller, so not like the beer in a big warehouse, but you know, smaller, um, more customized, whether maybe utilize more of the night or uh, evening star, um, things that people would like, like to have because filming has changed. And I want to give a, a shout out to Mayor Colleen, um, uh, probably on today that bring this, uh, these projects forward uh, during her term as mayor. So uh, I want to thank the city of Banning. They definitely are open to more business opportunities Opportunities, and that's what it takes. It takes the community. It takes the people, governments, everyone working together to make projects. Absolutely. Like this and that's one thing that I absolutely love about the guests that we've had. And that is that everyone is speaking in the same direction, right? When everyone is speaking in the same direction with the same objectives, with the same goals, then you start building that momentum. And once that momentum is built, then that's when you and we all get to see and realize this catalyst you know, transform our lives in the form of increased infrastructure, business opportunities, education, whatever it may be. That is 
exactly what we need in leaders like yourself that can lock arms with leadership across the board to move in the same direction is just everything. So for that, thank you so much for continuing your hard work and your dedication and your focus and for imparting your your love of you know, the community and making sure that those financial resources are there to support them are available. That is just absolutely tremendous. So I hope everyone that's listening, make sure to take a note of this and reach out to your local leadership, whether it's on the city council, your supervisors, you know, anybody and everybody that asks for your vote, you know, find out what you can do to enhance your community? What are the opportunities? Look for solutions. And um, that's what we want to do here today and every day with uh, guests such as Treasurer Ma. Thank you so much. I can't tell you thank you enough. I really, really can't. Um, but before you know, we end the program, I want you to share with us, um, what is your idea of a good year for California, right? Because when you talk about uh, financing, in terms of red and black, we're in the black right now, which is awesome when you talk about $100 billion. But what is your vision for the state of California moving forward? What is your goal? And um, just, you know, share with us your vision in your office moving forward. Sure. Uh, well, housing is a big priority, um, whether it's affordable housing, which I oversee through my bonds and tax credits or any type of housing. So we are working on a study right now uh, for the legislature and the governor to create a state fund for down payment assistance. And this would help uh, lower income working families afford to buy a house. Kind of like a shared appreciation mortgage where the state becomes like the silent um, you know, partner in, in home when the uh, the homeowner either sells the house, they would pay back uh, the down payment back to the state with some appreciation, or they uh, build equity and refinance, they can also pay it back. And we think this is a game changer. Getting more people into home ownership is the way we build equity uh, for individuals here. Um, also, more incentive programs. I'm a, a tax accountant, a CPA, so I understand that tax deductions and other incentives really do work. So putting more money into our Cal Competes program, which is a tax deferral, income tax deferral, or our sales tax exemption program so that people will be incentivized to buy uh, bigger, cleaner equipment and be able to waive their sales taxes, I think is a game changer for California. It pains me when I hear people People are moving out of the site. And so I really try to be that ambassador to thank people for being here, uh, hopefully uh, encourage them to pay that small weather tax, right? Living in California, it costs a little bit more, but um, I think for those who, who are dedicated to staying here, that weather tax, I think is, is, um, is not that uh, bad of a burden, but we also need to uh, create more jobs, uh, more jobs, higher income jobs. People who pay uh, income taxes is important for our budget. 95% of our general fund comes from individual income taxes, corporate taxes, and sales taxes. So if people are making you know, bonuses, um, cashing in their stock options, then they're paying their taxes and they're happy and they're spending money in the community, which generates sales taxes. Um, so just keeping an eye on our you know, fiscal health of our state, being able to um, incentivize, keep companies here, uh, entice companies to locate here is one of my top priorities here at the treasurer's office. Beautiful, beautiful. And just to reiterate, um, can you what you need from those that are seeking support and funding from your office in terms of a project or a program? Can you just do the ABC step by step? What do you need from them? Well, every project is different. So on my ad hoc committee, I have two members that are in your region. Uh, Dr. Ann, uh, who is on the Riverside um, uh, school board, but also 
chairs Governor Newsom's uh, Workforce Investment Board. So he is one of my economic uh, development ambassadors in the region, as well as Carlos Rodriguez. Uh, he is with the Building Industry Association and also in that uh, Inland Empire area. So I would encourage you to reach out uh, to one of them. I think many of you uh, know them because they are out and about in the community or reach out to me. My email is askfiona at treasure.ca.gov. Again, askfiona at treasure.ca. Dot gov invite me out uh, i'll be out in the region again uh, this weekend to see macy gray at the morongo casino um, so very excited to be out there but while i'm out there um, i like to set up tours and meetings and uh, just come and see what the needs are oh that is amazing thank you so much for being so integrated and joining our region and being just everywhere you know we, we talked briefly yesterday you were flying somewhere so you are a person on the move uh, doing great things for our state and all Californians. And so I'm just so excited. And thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Treasurer. But before we go, I'm going to give you the opportunity to give a shout out to your team because uh, I got to work with them and they're just amazing. Oh, I've got a great outreach team. Um, you probably uh, were on the phone uh, with Noah Starr, my uh, external affairs director, Gloria. Toledo, uh, who is in my Southern California office. Um, Seth Dalton uh, helps me with agricultural areas. Um, and so oh, I've just got a great team. Please reach out to us. We want to be of assistance. And thank you, Yvette, for being positive, reporting on things that people are doing that are helping the community good work because there's so much negativity in this world and it just drowns out all the good things. And so I thank you, Yvette, for all you're doing on your KMET 1490 uh, station. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to bring me to tears. Thank you so much, Treasurer Ma. Thank you. Um, so for everyone listening today, don't forget to look for us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on on scbrtalk.com and don't forget to download the free live streaming app on Google Play or the Apple App Store. Find us on YouTube and watch our interview with Christine Scott. She is a senior public affairs manager for the Southern California Gas Company, where she supports field operations by working with regional local governments on permitting, crisis, preparedness, and emergency response. She serves as the point of contact for communities throughout San Bernardino County, educating customers and stakeholders about SoCal gas activities, programs, services, and most importantly, safety. Prior to joining SoCal Gas, Christine served as Vice President of TMG Communications, a strategic communications firm specializing in public relations, community outreach, and government affairs. You is full of ways to cut costs on your gas bill, talks about payment assistant programs, and easy ways to save energy. Check it out. And so everyone, next week, we will feature Inland Empire Magazine's Samantha Smith, the new owner and publisher of Inland Empire Magazine. For the last 45 years, Inland Empire Magazine has established itself as the premier life-size publication in the Inland Empire region. Prior to becoming the owner, Samantha joined the magazine in 2016 and served as the senior advertising manager. Samantha began her advertising and marketing career paper as a local advertising rep, and she worked her way up through the ranks to become a majors and nationals advertising account manager, working with companies like Best Buy, Lowe's, t and Amazon. During the Press Enterprise and Orange County Register newspaper merger of 2013, Samantha was recruited to the OC Register Nationals team. In 2014, she was advertising manager where she led the Press Enterprise's advertising staff. Samantha attended UC Riverside where she graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in business. She lives in Riverside with her husband and three children. Samantha is working to grow the print and digital readership of Inland Empire Magazine with engaging local lifestyle, healthcare, education, and business content. Don't miss it, everyone. See you all next week.